session for the regular meeting and now we'll reconvene and call the meeting to order the first item is the consent agenda items I had the consent agenda items and I will make a motion to approve the um, vouchers okay and a second second Aaron all those in favor say aye aye aye, aye. opposed no there's none okay carried Next, we will have the community comments section. Um, there was a sign-up sheet in back. Becky's got Becky's it now. Got it. And so I'm going to read the format for our community comments. Welcome to this meeting of the Board of Education of the School District of Amy. We are pleased that you are interested in the school district education issues. Your input may be very beneficial to the development of appropriate educational programs. You may address the board only during the community comments time on the agenda. Emory School District residents, district employees, and guests invited by the board may address the board at the discretion of the presiding board member. In order for the meeting to flow smoothly, we would appreciate the following guidelines be followed by anyone wishing to address the Board of Education. For those wishing to speak before the board, a sign-up sheet will be available prior to the start of the meeting. If the topic noted on the sign-up sheet is deemed to be out of order, the presiding board member will inform the person wishing to speak prior to the start of the meeting. Comment time is limited to five minutes per person. However, the time limit may be increased or decreased at any time by the presiding board member. The time allocated for community comments may also be ended at the determination of the presiding board member. Comments and suggestions related to the school district operation are welcome. Personal criticism of members of the Board of Education or employees of the Amory School District is out of order. Please stand to be recognized and after being recognized, please give your name and address for the record. The board normally receives citizen input and does not respond or debate. If there is a need for an answer or response to a concern or issue, the district administrator or one of the other administrators may get back to you within the next week. If your concern requires board action, it may be placed on the agenda of the future board meeting. And I want to thank you for your cooperation. All right. And we have... Four. So the first is uh, Joe Vierkant. Joseph Vierkant, Blackbrook Township. Uh, I just wanted to address uh, the returning to school document that you're going to be presenting here in a little bit, Dr. Durfler, and the options. Uh, that I viewed on there is the matrix, the five different options. Um, and I thought the matrix was done with, and I hope that they are just options uh, presented to the board. And I guess I wish that there was a sixth option is no, no matrix. Um, For many different reasons, I guess, but I think we need a little bit more. Again, I wish I was able to see your presentation and then speak, but I think we need to see a little bit more communication to the community, um, whether it's a survey or whatnot, on on what we're going to do for these health precautions. And and again, I just find it a little odd. Just I mean, if you were out and about last weekend. I mean, there were quite a few things not being followed up but during Fall Fest in regards to COVID. So uh, just please, I hope that we have more communication about that before anyone motions or seconds a vote. Uh, and I guess second, last month I also did budget. So, and that's, uh, I mean, you guys did it faster than fast. And I want to thank you. I know it's, it takes a ton of time and effort. And now, you know, the thing is, is you got to be held accountable for a budget you necessarily don't know yet. But thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Stephanie Jansen. Stephanie Jansen, Garfield Township. Um, I have some handouts. Can I just pass them? <coughs> pass them down? Sure. 
So I just kind of want to piggyback on what Joe said. Um, I also wish that I could see the presentation regarding the matrix and the reopening school plan before commenting. Um, it's been brought to my attention that the, the number of positive cases has changed just in the last maybe day or so um, from when I last looked at that PDF or that presentation on the book board. But what I have here and what you guys have in front of you are um, the number of students that have been counted ill on a week by week basis in the elementary school alone since 2007, 2008 school year. And you'll see on the very first column, it's got the week of the school week starting at week 36. Um, Obviously, that fluctuates with when we start school, when we have Christmas break, and when we end. But it gives us an idea. This is data, I think, that we need to be looking at when we decide if we're going to move forward with any type of matrix, what we're going to do, because this is what our school district, this is what our elementary school um, has experienced since on a year-by-year, week-by-week basis since 2000, 2007, 2008. Now, 2009 and 2010 was the H1N1 pandemic. It swept through our nation. It was um, the most at risk for that were our children. And you can look at what our elementary school looked like that year in 2009, 2010. And don't quote me exactly on the week but um, or the day of the month, I guess. Week 41 and 42, or I'm sorry, 42 and 43. So that was sometime in October. You're gonna see that there were 95 students missing in a one week period. These absences were recorded um, by the county. It's voluntary information sent from our school district and they reported on Tuesday. So this goes week by week. There were 95 kids that were missing from our elementary school. The following week there were 84. That's with no intervention. We didn't step in. Um, I know that the school district, the school nurse was under um, special guidance from the, I don't know if she did it from the CDC or whatever, um, with the appropriate mask wearing. Um, I did talk to Lene in a phone conversation that I was also in with Sean. She said she masked about five kids that year. And I'm just, I'm asking you guys to take into consideration what our numbers look like right now and what our kids are experiencing reflective on the, the information that we have for our school district, for our elementary building alone. Um, on the very end, you can see the 2020, 2021 positive cases. These numbers were pulled off the matrix that were done on a week by week basis. It's reflective to what you have here with all this data. 2018-2019 uh, was also another uh, rough year for the flu. However, when I asked the Polk County Health Department about this information, they said they didn't have it for that year. There's also another year too I squeezed out just so that I could get this all to fit on one page. Um, but if you look back in your records, you'll be able to see at the elementary on a week by week what those numbers reflect in 2000. 18 and 2019. I think this is just really important information for us to have when we're deciding what to do with uh, the matrix and moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Lori Burns. Hi, I'm Lori Burns from City of Amory. I have uh, seven children, two that have already graduated from Amory, and I have five currently here. Um, my concern is that last year when our children were exposed, we were told that they had to quarantine. Those, that was during the time when we were all wearing masks in school, and now there's nobody wearing masks in school except for my family and a few others. Um, and they're getting exposed at school yet we're told that they can come back to school the next day. I don't get how that can go from 14 days with masks to now 
no requirement for them to be quarantined. I think that's ridiculous. Um, my daughter has been exposed twice so far since school year started. She has a compromised immune system. Um, she has been hospitalized three times with pneumonia, and I certainly don't want her in the school exposed. Um, she's wearing a mask. However, she also has special needs. Um, there's really not that amount of accommodation for a child with special needs in the home. Um, she did do that last year, but I'm trying to think, you know, should I pull my child from school? Should I have her at home trying to get education and special education? Uh, she has hearing aids. Um, she has a lot of special needs besides just health, um, learning disabilities. And so now I'm feeling like, do I pull her today? Because now this is her second exposure. I'm not given any information of how she was exposed, whether or not it was an adult, a child. Was it a long exposure? Was it five minute exposure? I don't think that's, I understand you can't tell us who is exposing the children, but um, I'm very concerned for her health and her education. So, you know, I wanna make sure that if she is going to be home, she's going to get the proper education. Um, but I just think if at this point, if we're going to be exposing our kids to COVID, there should be some sort of quarantine. Masks, I think, should be required. I know that's a big issue and people are afraid to do that, but the numbers are going up. Hospitals across the nation are getting told that we can't accept patients, not just for COVID patients, but for any medical. There's no ICU beds across the board. So we're having lots of increases in our hospital and also increases for the exposure to kids. So now last year, we didn't have that many um, COVID cases that were really causing too many problems for children. This year, it looks different. This school year already, we're seeing an increase in the amount of children that are being exposed to COVID. And um, I would just like you to take into consideration masks, as well as uh, a different type of response to when our kids are being exposed to COVID and what we're gonna do about that. Ex you know, allowing our children to come back after exposure, I think is just going to lead to more exposure in our class, in our school. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> and next, uh, Julie Vierkant. Uh, Julie Vierkant, Black Township. Uh, good afternoon. I just want to um, say that I, I still believe strongly that we should keep masks as optional. And the, with looking at your back to school plan, all of your five options include mask mandatory at some point in time. Um, and I always ask, we've been waiting for actual science showing how masks are helping and preventing stuff. We did this all last year. We still quarantine children, healthy children, multiple times throughout the year and their education still lacked. Um, we also heard last year that Amory is not an island, so Amory must consider the um, county numbers, but yet when we got to the springtime, high school got to have their, their play in person, middle school got to have their in-person um, choir and band concerts, whereas I was unable to go to the intermediate school here to watch my children do theirs, and so we had to go online and watch them in masks socially distanced to do this. And I, I heart, my heart hurts for kids to have to think that they could do that again. And yes, we are seeing a spike of kids being sick because it is the fall. They have been socially distanced this past year and a half. Um, and now like when I was a child, I didn't go to daycare. So my first four years of education, I was sick every year. You can go back to my records back 35 years ago if you guys still have them and see that that's, I was sick every year. That's what happens every year, we get sick we move on. And this is no different than a normal flu, a stronger flu, but a flu. And I'm concerned about your wording of how you are taking um, recommendations and uh, um, recommendations and uh, guidances as a law. Biden announced that he was going to mandate the vaccine for all of the government employees with exemptions that do not include those for health and religious to the following groups of people, Congress, congressional staff, judicial branch, White House staff, CDC employees, FDA employees, USPS employees, NIAD employees, Pfizer and Moderna employees. 
and illegal aliens. Yet my company is going to try to make me mandate to take a vaccine based on these recommendations that the president is taking as a mandate. I am concerned that we are allowing the CDC, who is not making laws, to, to decide what we need to do. But yet, if you look at what, how they exempt it, that doesn't make sense. How, how can you mandate this, but they exclude this group of people, and why? They, don't, they can't catch COVID? I, I, that would be great to see. And I don't know if you guys knew or not, but the CDC changed the terminology of vaccine, the definition. The old version is a product that stimulates a person's immunity to a specific disease, protecting that person from that disease. Vaccines are usually administered through needle injections, but can be administered by mouth or sprayed in the nose. They changed it in the past month to state a preparation that is used to stimulate the body's immune response against diseases. Vaccines are usually administered, administered through needle injections, but some can be administered by mouth or sprayed into the nose. So now we're trusting the CDC, who changed it, we used to have immunity to that disease, to like, eh, it might protect it. That's, that's a huge red flag for me, that I, how do I trust that? And why do I want to trust my children to something that they can change as a whim and change the entire meaning of that simple little word? I would like also to remind everybody that we still are a Congress, uh, constitutional republic where we do follow the Constitution. By following a mandate or a policy that goes against the Constitution is not okay. And also for the, uh, to doing it for the common good of people is actually a communist trait we should be very, very leery of. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Laura Jensen. Um, I'm from Johnstown Township. I'm a Amory High School alumni. I graduated in 2014, and my mom is currently a teacher in the district. Um, since graduating, I'm now working on my master's degree in animal molecular and cellular biology at the University of Florida, so I like to think of myself as a scientist now. And I want to urge you to consider making masks mandatory for everyone in the school district. Um, since the start of COVID at the university, I've spent a lot of time looking at long histology slides, listening to different presentations on COVID, and it's kind of terrifying when you see the permanent lung damage and long-term effects that people can suffer from this. And since I'm a scientist, I think it's really important to listen to the facts and realize that data doesn't lie to you. The numbers don't lie. And so I have these data points from John Hopkins Hospital and the Center for Disease Control. And I like us to remember that at this point in the United States, 672,000 people are dead because of COVID. And I work in large data science analysis, and I know large numbers are hard for the human brain to comprehend. So if we think about that number, 672,000 as days, and we convert that to years, that's 1,841 years. That's a huge amount of time. That's a huge amount of people that we've lost in this country. And within that, up to this point, I think there's over 500 children who have died from COVID. And to me, 500 kids dead is too many. I know that we like to think that we've kind of gotten past this, but we are in the fourth wave with a more virulent variant of COVID. And in Wisconsin, last week, there were close to 18,000 new cases. In Polk County, we have 338 people currently isolated for COVID. And we know that there are more cases than that active in the community because there's always asymptomatic people who don't know that they have it and could be spreading it now. I also think it's important to remember to listen to our experts. I know the person before me mentioned not trusting the Center for Disease Control, um, but I'd like us all to remember that Dr. Fauci literally wrote the textbook that's used in medical schools for doctors in terms of infectious disease. He's been cited over 200,000 times, which in science is a big number. 
And the CDC has put out multiple statements that they realize how important it is for students to be in school, not only for learning and opportunities like that, but for social skills and gaining those. And so they highly recommend everyone over the age of two wear masks when in doors and in crowded areas. Um, I also read a study from the Mayo Clinic, which I think provides some of the best medical information you can find on the internet, that shows there's no negative health effects for children wearing masks. And to me, I think the major system you proposed is a great idea when we're looking at moving to remote learning versus in-person, but I think it's not adequate for deciding when to wear masks because masks are a preventative measure. A seatbelt doesn't work if you put it on after you're in a car accident. And so we should be wearing masks before there's any cases in the school. I don't think it's fair that one person can make a decision that risks the lives of 20 other people. We know that the r naught, which is the ability of a, a virus to spread, for COVID is about 3.5. So that means one person with COVID can infect, usually typically infects 3.5 other people. But we have seen countless times throughout this pandemic, super spreader events, where one person can infect 10, 20, 100 people. And so you could have someone walking around the school with no symptoms who does not know they have COVID and they could infect 100 people. And they could infect people who have compromised immunities or are older and don't have the immune system to fight it. And we've seen plenty of young, healthy people die from this as well. An anecdotal evidence for this, at the University of Florida, when we've reopened, they fully reopened this fall for all students and staff. The university is about 50,000 people, and Florida is doing a lot worse at COVID than the rest of the country is. And currently, because they have mask mandates in place, along with routine testing on campus, they run a rate of less than 3% COVID on campus. And I think that's pretty impressive. So they do work. And you can keep everyone safe here. I do think this is a community issue, and I do think it's a community solution. And I really hope that you consider everyone safety and realize that wearing a mask is a minor inconvenience in regards to someone's life. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> With the conclusion of that, we'll move to our administrative and committee reports. All right, well, we've, we've, we're off to a great start at AHS. Um, very busy week. We had homecoming events last week. Um, we've had Miss Amory competition. Our band has marched both in the Glenwood City Parade and the Fall Festival last weekend, and they did the halftime show this past week. Um, we're definitely at the midway point of our fall sports seasons, and um, we've seen a lot of success there as well. Uh, in terms of building updates, the library wall flashing project is complete and looks very nice. Um, number of future events coming up. Um, we're in the planning stage for our academic and career planning in service, um, October 11th at the, for the high school staff, which is different than the other buildings. Um, PSAT will be coming up for any interested junior October 13th. We have our parent-teacher conferences with the academic and career planning model on October 14th. And before I see you again, we'll have students involved in fall sports playoffs. So that's it from the high school if you don't have any questions. All right, uh, Josh had mentioned parent-teacher conferences and um, we're excited to get those going here in October at the middle school uh, and I think throughout the district we'll be doing them um, where parents will sign up for slots on times and parents can choose to either do them over the phone or come in in person and meet so they have the option of what works best for them and teachers will accommodate that. Um, Next Monday, we have um, an in-service day and staff training, and we're real excited at the middle school. We're gonna be working on building goals, and we're gonna be working on um, some professional learning community activities as they learn on how to intervene with kids that need um, more assistance on essential standards. Uh, we'll be working on PBIS and other student management programs, and then also concentrating on methods to work with kids that have gone through trauma. So I'm excited for the in-service that day. We have a lot of different student trainings coming up that we're excited about. We have our student leadership team training on October 13th where we work with kids that were 
sort of maybe you would have considered like student council um, and they'll be working on uh, on learning how to work for other kids and, and be strong leaders and then help design some goals for our school. Uh, we'll be doing a peer tutor training on October 19th and teaching kids on not only how to help someone, one of their peers that maybe needs the assistance, but then how to handle confidentiality in that same setting. Uh, we'll do a peer mediation training on October 21st and that um, is a training where we teach specific kids um, who, who are interested on how to help handle conflicts within the school on some of the minor issues and they could, could go to peer mediation if they so chose. Uh, we just did a Dramarama sign up and Dramarama is an or activity that's grades three through eight where they can do one act plays or small group five minute um, performances in a, in a drama competition. And um, we also have a Destination Imagination signing up in October. Um, starting um, right, after, right after this end of this month, we're gonna be working on goal setting with our students. It's part of our advisory program where we are tying our character ed programs. We start talking about the importance of setting goals for yourself and meeting goals, um, how to make those goals uh, challenging, get realistic, and how to work towards them and organize themselves. So we'll be working with that with our kids. And then finally we have, <coughs> excuse me, on October 8th we have um, our eighth grade WAPO leadership in anti-bullying field trip. And so that uh, is for all eighth grade students and we go out to the um, Camp WAPO, I believe it's the, um, the northern one, help me out. Ox Lake. Ox Lake. They're gonna be out at Ox Lake and they use the low ropes course and it's kind of a team building. Um, they have to work together to accomplish a lot of tasks. And then we come back and we talk about, there's an anti-bully presentation. It's really centered on um, how we treat each other at school and how to um, treat everyone um, fairly. And, um, and the, there's some music and some other fun activities involved in that. So it's gonna be a busy month, but we're excited. Any questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. It's been um, very busy three weeks of school at the intermediate school. Um, we are ongoing with our ELA adoption. Um, during in-service, the elementary and intermediate school staff met with a representative from CESA to evaluate the two curriculums that we're looking at on Monday. We have both vendors coming and they're gonna be presenting to our staff on both curriculums. And then following that, we're gonna make a plan on which curriculums we're going to pilot and whichever one's gonna meet our best needs. So that's ongoing. Um, our open house and orientation went wonderful. It was very well attended. Um, our first few days of school, we had very exciting activities going on. Um, it was great to have the buzz around the school. Those are my favorite days. PBIS, we had our first monthly drawing take place last week, so that was my first. It was very exciting um, to see students place their well-earned tickets in the bucket and then pull them out for prizes. Um, PAC leadership team has met this month. Um, we are going over our fast bridge screeners. That was a new system to us. We were one of the first two schools to go. I believe us in the middle school went first. We had very minor hiccups. Um, we'll continue this week and next week to look at our data based from our screeners and then that'll help drive our intervention and our, and our um, instruction from that point. We have begun our new monthly staff classes. So on Monday, I met with new staff and then new to Amory staff to go over our EE procedures. IPO has a fundraiser going on through Sports and More where you can purchase warrior gear for staff and students in support of our Like a Warrior on Fridays. Um, our fourth and fifth grade leadership students participated in the homecoming parade. They were very excited. Um, Community Ed Tracy had made a banner for us that said, um, work hard, be kind, and amazing things will happen at the intermediate school. So our fourth and fifth grade students were really excited to walk in the parade. There was a lot of buzz about that. Um, and finally, we have our AIM classrooms are visiting local farms. And some of those farms include Bullbrook Keep, Turnip Rock, Z Orchard, and Blackbrook Farm. So our AIM classrooms are learning about um, agriculture in our areas. 
Some of the upcoming things that we have on October 1st, we have our first warrior rally and all school drawing. We have Food for America on the 8th. We have high school coming over to guide with that. And then as Tom and Josh have both shared, we have parent teacher conferences on October 11th and October 14th. Otherwise, that's it. Do you guys have any questions? Wonderful, thank you. Good. I could just say ditto to her report. <laughs> We're working very closely together because of ELA adoption. And um, we have quite a leadership committee. We've got 16 people representing the elementary and intermediate school that are involved in that process. And we feel very confident going into our in-service day on this coming Monday. Um, both of the programs that we are bringing in um, are based on the science of reading, which is recent, not recent, but a lot of um, over the last oh, five to 10 years of research on um, what makes kids learn to read. And so we're pretty excited to dive into these programs. They're a little different than what we've had in the past. And so um, as Jessica said, they're going to be here presenting all day long. Half each each um, program gets a half a day to um, share their stuff with us. So more on that, as we have said. Um, in addition to that, we, along with the other schools have been doing benchmark assessments. This is our week to do FastBridge. This is our second, um, our second, our second year is what <laughs> the word I was looking for. Um, last year, the elementary school started with FastBridge, and now everybody else is joining us. And that will be beautiful because we can watch that data throughout the years with all of our students. Upcoming events on this Thursday, September 23rd, we have our first Parents as Partners Committee meeting. So I'd like to invite any parent that wants to be part of it. It's, it's like a, a parent organization that works with me. And I would love to invite them to the elementary school at 8.30 AM this Thursday. And we have our fundraiser, Cherry Dow fundraiser kickoff on October 7th. And um, Cherrydale, this is the second year using Cherrydale. They do a lot of online options for families. And all the proceeds for that go into things for kids, um, AKA the beautiful new pro, um, playground we have at the intermediate school, or at the elementary school. <laughs> Sorry, Jess. Um, the kids are loving it. We had to caution it off for a few minor repairs. Um, right away and the kids were very sad that that happened so but we're up and running again um, parent teacher conferences as Tom referred to we are giving families options and at the elementary school we're also going to offer the zoom option so they can have a, a telephone conference a zoom conference or an in-person conference and last but not least we have family math night scheduled for September 30th. And at this point in time, we have over 200 registrations for that event. So we're looking forward to that. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Just a couple quick updates from People Services. Um, as you know, uh, the district is focused on um, trauma-sensitive schools and supporting the social, emotional, um, and mental health of students. And so with that, one of the um, main data indicators for uh, that work is the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. That's coming up. That's a, that's a uh, survey on um, risk factors, it really kind of predicting, um, allows us to help kind of predict and see where students might need support. And those are delivered at the high school and the middle school. Um, they predict things like students that might be at risk for truancy, dropout, um, difficulty with relationships, um, social and emotional well-being, those sorts of things. And that really helps to um, not only look at those kids that are really <coughs> struggling, but to build our tier one and tier two systems. Um, some of the things that Tom had mentioned, certainly, and that, that everyone here has mentioned in terms of those peer mediation, um, positive activities with students, and teaching that social emotional wellness. Uh, so that really falls right under the school-based mental health work that we're doing and uh, work that we're able to 
tie to our, our great grant um, where we're able to really get more of those resources and activities and uh, you know really target um, our instruction and our activities uh, toward those students that, that need the most support. Um, another thing coming up is of course is our post-secondary transition indicator 14 surveys are due at the end of this month. Um, we get um, approximately a thousand dollars for each of those 12th grade well, those who have graduated in the last year's cohort, um, and really those students that are uh, um, gainfully employed or engaged in post-secondary outcomes, those are the ones that, that we're able to um, really cash in, so to speak, on that incentive um, to keep that work and move that work forward and helping to support uh, students with disabilities um, with their post-secondary outcomes. Um, Child Find, uh, Child Development Days will be uh, on October 14th and coincide with uh, the uh, parent-teacher conferences. So we're at work uh, gathering those lists and sending out that information so we can um, contact as many families as possible um, and really try to identify um, those on the other end of the spectrum, kids that may be struggling on entry into school instead of um, that transition um, over into the adult world. So those are a few activities, much more going on, but um, we'll wrap it up. So thank you. With those um, child development days, is that held here at the school? Yeah, at this time, that, that's the plan. Okay. We'll continue to monitor and see what things happen, but at this time we're gonna- At the elementary um, school? Yeah, at the elementary school. Thanks. Thank you. I don't know, is that it for our administrative reports? Or did you want to yes, say Yes, that yeah. is it. Then we'll move on to our informational items, which you're up with the community okay, survey. Okay, community survey is uh, the first item on the informational items. Uh, this is draft number eight of the survey, so it has uh, gone through a lot of revisions and we'll continue to go through more. I'll just give you the highlights of the survey. This is the same survey that the community will see on Wednesday, and then the, probably a modified version by the time we get out to the 30th when this group meets again to formally approve the survey. The highlight on the first page is the timeline. The survey will land in mailboxes if all goes well on Monday, October 20th. You can either do it in a hard copy version or you can do it online. And then the survey deadline is November 8th. It's an independent operation by school perceptions. We don't see any of the responses by person. We simply get the end total results. So that's the highlight on the first page. The second page, you will note uh, the top of the page, it shares how we are doing academically. Amory School District for years and years um, has outperformed the state in regards to standardized test performance, specifically on reading and math, and that's what this chart A depicts. Chart B and chart C uh, depicts the decreasing mill rate in the School District of Amory over the course of the last seven consecutive years from all the way back in 2000. 13, 14, all the way to the present, seven consecutive years of decreased taxation for our public. This next year, that no rate will be projected to be 7.85 or 7.86, depending on how you round. So it will go up uh, very slightly. Chart C shows uh, the public how we compare to our middle border conference um, cohorts. And you'll see there from far left Prescott all the way down to Amory at 7.74. We are significantly less than the rest of the conference and significantly less than the state. The state average is in the mid nines. Um, what that tells you is we have been responsible in not overtaxing our public. Seven years in a row and we're the lowest in the conference and one of the top 10% lowest in the state. The next page, uh, it is listed as recommended plan. Everything at this point is recommended. There isn't any formally approved plan and resolution for a referendum. Everything right now is subject to change. This is the recommendation from the work done that was presented here by John Hunick of Cross Anderson and Troy Miller of LHB Architects. These are the list of projects that would need to be addressed in each of the four buildings. I'm not going to list all of these off for you. You can certainly take a look at them on your own. If there are specific questions that the board might have, I'd certainly be happy to help. But those are the recommended items to address. And at the bottom page, it's actually 32.7, but for ease of math right now, it's noted as $33 million in deferred maintenance. That which needs to be fixed is in essence what deferred maintenance is. 
funding support. You'll see on the next page a graph that shows our portfolio from 1314 forward to the projected rate for next year at 786. 786. And if we are to increase the um, mill rate to address the 33 million, that would move up 1.41 which would move our mill rate to 9.27, which gets us comparable, not exactly, to 2018-19, comparable, but nowhere near the rates of uh, 2017 and prior. Um, that's the price of doing business. If the community wants to invest in the future, they'll have to let us know if that's something that they're interested in doing, and that's the question that you see right there in the box, the first of all of the questions that would be asked, uh, $33 million to address that at that price tag. The next question, or questions, there are two of them, are the questions about additional projects. The priorities of the district, unless the board feels differently, they'll have to say as much. The first priority is to address the stuff in district that needs to be fixed before it gets any worse. We again, re remember we have a high school built in 1976 for $3.7 million, so it's some 50 years old and it's built for less money than it would cost just to fix the walls around the high school, which is 4.25. In addition, we have an elementary school that was built in 1967, built like a fortress, but it's built in 1967. There are issues that need to be addressed there. Middle school was built in 1992. There are issues that exist there. And this building here we're in right now isn't new anymore. It's 20 years old. So there are some entranceway issues and some uh, in essence, issues on the face of things that need to be addressed. Not as many as the high school, certainly, but there are items. So that's priority one in the district. And I know there's a narrative out there about putting in a pool, addressing child care. Our priority one as a district is to address the uh, items that have to be fixed. If the public is interested, they'll have to weigh in and tell us about how they feel. The first item is the early childhood child care center which in essence is noted as, uh, for most, the vernacular is clubhouse. Uh, would you support a referendum to put it in a clubhouse facility? That, ball, that price is a ballpark of seven million. It could be as low as one or two. It could be as high as 10 or 15, depending on what that you want that facility to be. If the facility is uh, not attached to a present building and is a standalone structure, you have separate HVAC, you have separate plumbing, you have separate parking, you have se separate uh, water runoff, you have separate everything, so the price goes up. So that is a reasonable approximation based on what LHB and KA have told us, in addition to uh, Lisa Voison uh, from Baird Financial. The three of them together that we've been working with have nearly 100 years of referendum experience. That's the estimation that they give us. The Next and last additional project item is a swimming pool, and you've heard a lot about that. Uh, the number that presently exists, and this is as of 5.30 today, uh, LHB Architects gave the number of 12.5 million for a pool, and they came up, come up with that number by doing an aggregate of all similar type projects throughout the states of Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa. That's the group that uh, LHB works with, and 12.5, again, if you want it to be the Michael Phelps 50 meter Olympic size, whatever, whatever pool, it could be 20 million. If you want it to be something you put in Aaron's backyard, it's probably going to be far less than that. <laughs> so it's somewhere between there, 12.5. 12 million is exactly what Baldwin paid to put theirs in, and theirs had a grand opening some two weeks ago. So that's a real time, very recent price tag. So that's the uh, last of the questions, if you will, in regards to how you feel about deferred maintenance and additional projects. The last page is uh, all of the uh, demographic information, how you, want to how you want us to communicate with you, and then a satisfaction question, and that is it. It has to be eight pages. It cannot be any more for mailing purposes. That's the directive I've been given by school perception. So I will turn it over to you if you have any questions, comments, feedback. This is not a final version by any means. This, again, is draft number eight. There's probably eight more to come. It's just where we stand right now. Any feedback that you might have or questions you might have? So um, this would apply to 
residents in the school district of Amory not if they open and enroll their children to Amory? Do they have any? Well, it applies, to, it applies to everybody in that if you send your kid here from some other place, you'd be interested to know what's going to happen with the facilities. Right. But are they able to fill out the survey then? Those who are uh, in our school district that reside in our school district would be who would receive the survey. And they could do that again electronically or they can do that via. So if they don't reside in our school district, but they That's my send their children here. That is my understanding of it. Do I have that wrong, Tracy Hendrickson? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, there is a box here that says in, okay. in which municipality you live in. Okay. You do not live in the I will. How about I'll do this for you? I will find out for certain. I know it's, the, it, it's a small segment of society, but it matters. Yeah. Yeah. I will find that out for sure, and I will provide that answer, and we will certainly have that answer on the 30th. I guess I don't know. Good question. Other questions or comments, <coughs> feedback? Again, the community will see this exact same survey on Wednesday, and then you will see it on the 30th. It has to be approved in order for it to be sent to the printers. That process takes about three weeks for it to get printed up and then in land in mailboxes. Again, the date is we're looking at is Monday, October 20th. But it could be the 21st, it could be the 22nd. But around then. I guess my other question is, you know, it says on the front that you'll have a survey code and it can only be used once mm -hmm. to obtain additional surveys for other adults in your household. Is, I guess, you know, are you hoping to have a survey from every adult or just one per household? Or I don't have an agenda in that regard. We simply want to hear from a cross section of our public in regards to how they feel about these items. We've always talked about this is not a decision we make in isolation and it's certainly not a decision that I make in isolation. This is, after all, the community schools. We want to hear what they have to say. The more, the better. If we've got more answers, I think we have better results. So if two respondents from the same household occurs, that's great. Other items? OK, that's the presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. Next is always the fun one. Donations to the district. Oh, no, no, we're not quite that far down the agenda. Oh, you skipped right on down. <laughs> you skipped I a bunch of stuff. Well, okay. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> Was there a Packer game or something you got to get to or what? Uh, yeah. Well, and then somebody playing a game tonight? Somebody. <laughs> right, Tom? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Let's not get into it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, the next item is uh, piggybacking what I just presented, which is September 22nd. We've got a community engagement meeting. The two items on the agenda will be Lisa Voison from Baird presenting uh, a more deeper picture of our financials. Uh, and second item on the agenda is school perceptions. But really, the highlighted item on the agenda isn't on the agenda, which is community feedback. We want folks to come and share how they feel. So they'll have an opportunity to do that September 22nd, which is this Wednesday, 6 p.m., high school auditorium. Do we need to know? If more of us, if three are going to uh, If there. three or more of you are there, we, we would have a quorum, and then you would need to actually make it a, a, a meeting. But we've already got a meeting posted, so we've covered ourselves there. Okay. Thank you. You don't have to tell me now if you're coming. I'll sort of spot you in the crowd. If you can't, I understand. Okay. Next oh. will be George. Okay. George and I are going to walk through. This is sort of good news to share, uh, things that you don't often think about or know until you actually see it in pictures. The elementary school HVAC project is sort of a story that goes all the way back to March, April, when there was lots of noise in the elementary school and we discovered we needed to fix our HVAC system or we would no longer have heat and we would no longer have air conditioning. I guess if everyone was comfortable with 60 degrees and raining like it is now, we would probably be okay, but it's gonna get cold, I imagine, at some point and it will get warm again in the summer. So we had to fix it. So we used our ESSER dollars from the federal government to, in part, fix it. So what you see here are some pictures about what it was, what it looked like in the middle, and what it is now. So George, do you want to take it from here? Yeah, each, each one of those pictures uh, depicts some of the issues that have come up since 1967. Um, replacing guards that uh, basically we had to build on site. Um, one of the pictures, uh, I believe, on the next one there on the far uh, left uh, on the other screen, um, or the center one, it depicts, oh, you can go back. The, the one in the center depicts uh, a grease zerk that 
was behind um, that concrete block that we could never service. So uh, literally, we'd have to bust a hole through the block and go through Cheryl Meyer's office to get a, a bearing replaced. So um, the exciting part of the new system is we don't have bearings. They're all direct drive, DC motors. Um, we've load shed half the horsepower that we have to run the building. And we're only running at 50% with three quarters of the air handlers that were installed. So I'm very excited to be here. I can't wait if you guys want to do a tour of that building. Um, but here, here's the new system. Um, some of the things to, to see, besides that they're nice and shiny, is you'll see the insulation on a lot of the ductwork. Uh, in 1967, common practice was to insulate the inside of the duct on chilled water um, systems. Uh, when we get to the end, you'll see why that wasn't a good idea. Now we're, out, we're insulating the outside to, um, to keep that from condensating. Um, new piping, we had valves up there that we did one of these things if we actually had to turn it off because when we turned it back on, you, they, they ultimately leaked. Um, so we have new butterfly valves, no more gate valves. So there's some of the insulation I talked about. Space is unbelievable now. When you go back into that room, um, you don't have to do the limbo um, to get to that back air handler. Um, yeah, it's, it's just incredible. Uh, every time I go up there, I can't believe we're, we're, we were lucky enough to be able to do this. Um, it's working great. I have like zero complaints right now. Everybody over there is happy. They haven't dialed in their numbers yet. We're going into the heating system. You shouldn't have said that out loud. Yeah, yeah. That, one's happy. <laughs> that was a bad idea. Cheryl's in her office. That's so nice. So far, uh, uh, the cooling side of things, it's worked out very well, and um, we'll get everything reprogrammed in where everybody uh, is happy. Uh, on the left, pit, or that picture, um, if you can go back up one more. You'll see that there's doors on there now, and we're actually able to get in there and service these units. Um, there's variable frequency drives on the DC motors. Um, they're very quiet, um, so it's it's just great. Word has it, uh, I wasn't there, but um, Joe Mara, the guy previous to me, had heard that we were actually doing an upgrade up there, and he's like, there's no way. There's no way you could put a new system up there like we have um, and still be able to get around in the room. And of course, that was, that was the question um, early in the spring. Uh, both the two major vendors said, I don't think we can make this work. And after they looked at the system up there, they said, there's no way this works. Well, I basically put my foot down and said, it's been working since 1967. Give me the same CFMs and we'll go from there. I'll take the blame. It was a pretty easy choice for me because we were limping one unit that served half of that building. So um, anyway, it, it's, it's unbelievable. It's great. It works great. And um, we're very lucky to have that. We are, at, okay, this is, this is another reason why. So that's insulated duct uh, from the inside. It's not cleanable. Um, they use either a beater brush or some kind of vacuum, so literally you couldn't do anything to clean that dock work. Um, from the get-go, I said we need to get rid of, re either replace the duct or come up with a different strategy. And that strategy was they couldn't replace it because it would have cost a fortune to remove it, but they said they would remove the insulation, insulate the outside, and clean uh, that dock work. And it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Looks brand new. Yeah. So that's very that exciting. Is. Thank yeah. you for all your work. <coughs> oh, on it's that. This, this one's been great. And Harris did a fabulous job. They got done on time. We really didn't have um, very many issues. And what, you know, if there was maybe a little dust that got away from them uh, or some uh, smoke smell or something. They were right on top of it to, to let us know that they apologized, and it, it, it just worked out great. And they spent the entire summer there. Um, every day there was three or four people working, so very pleased.
The goal was to address the problem, but we have the best ventilation we've ever had at the elementary based on this upgrade in a 50-year-old building. So mission accomplished in that regard. And hopefully, well, the next thing we would have to do is when we're plowing <coughs> ice or the elementary to the ground, it shouldn't have to be fixed again for a long time. Thanks, George. Yeah, I'd great. like to add one more thing. Um, Josh had mentioned that the through wall flashing project was complete. It's 98% complete. Um, Keith would know what a punch list is. Uh, where that yeah. hasn't circulated yet, but there's a few bricks that uh, popped on top that'll be replaced. There's some caulking along the, the new sidewalk that needs to be done, and a few other cleanup things. So if you see the guys back there, and they're saw cutting out some bricks. Don't worry, no major problems, just some things that were missed during the process. So, yep. thank you. George's new title is Building Geek. What's that? Your new title is Building Geek. <laughs> <laughs> he owns thank you. It. Uh, with that, we will go to our action items. And first up is the update on the COVID 19 return to school plan. Are we adopted? plan on August 20th and as I said to you then we'll revisit this every month until there is no need to revisit it ever again uh, so here we are uh, September 20th a month later um, with a revisit so the update to the return to school plan I'm going to highlight items that are in blue because those would be changes so the items in black I'm not going to spend as much time on I'll simply make mention of them in places this is a district administration board of education product. Uh, the board has made clear to me that they want to weigh in if there's changes, so here we are. Uh, we're going to base our information on health data and information that we have available, and uh, we'll comply with any order that's given to us in the form of a state, local, state, local, or federal authority. The first, um, where, f first place where you see changes is on the page titled Symptoms. Uh, we met again here on September tw or on August 20th. Our meeting that the district committee had with Polk County Health was called uh, and held on August 26th. So we did not have some of the information you see here on August 20th. It simply hadn't occurred yet. So that's where some of the changes come from. So symptoms. I'm not going to list off all of the symptoms. You can read them there for yourself. It's the standard COVID symptoms that have been in existence for quite some time. Uh, parents should check students for COVID symptoms outside of their baseline each day before school and don't send your kids to school if they're sick. Symptoms continued on the next page. If an individual has additional or worsening symptoms, consider contacting a medical provider to see if a COVID test is recommended. Um, it's not being, um, it, it's simply the recommendation is to, to get COVID tested uh, if a doctor thinks that's the way to go. Uh, COVID symptoms uh, will be excluded until asymptomatic for 24 hours without medication. Um, please communicate with the school with uh, where you stand on attendance as it relates to COVID so we can properly excuse them from school. Uh, positive cases, notify the school nurse immediately if you have a positive COVID result from a lab certified test. Polk County Health tells us that they won't accept and medical providers won't accept at-home tests. They want that to be done in a lab setting. So that's where that verbiage comes from. County Health will contact families with a positive case with further instructions. If we have a positive case referred to us, we let the county know. If they have a positive case that came to them first, they let us know. There's a tracker where that all occurs. And at that point, they correspond with uh, families. Uh, we are not referring up to Polk County Health any of the close contacts, anyone that would be eligible for a quarantine. We don't report any of those names up, just the positive cases. And we'll get to the positive case number a little bit later. Positive cases will be excluded for 10 days from onset of symptoms. Uh, the positive case timelines are set in essence by Polk County Health, but we're on the same page with how to do that now since we've been doing it for quite some time. Family members living in the same household as a positive COVID case will be school excluded per county health guidance. So if there is a household situation where there is a positive, if a sibling, for instance, is positive, they will go ahead and let that household know how to proceed. Uh, some have asked me, what if the parent is positive and they're still sending their kids to school? 
we don't know that the parent's positive and we're not going to call them and ask. That's not our place to call them and ask them. If county health does that, that's certainly their place. But we're not calling people to ask COVID status of people in the homes. That's, again, not our place. Close contacts. Uh, district will contact trace positive cases. Most schools, districts in CESA 11 are not doing contact tracing. They're simply identifying positive and reporting positive. They're not contact tracing and quarantining. I know none of the middle border conference schools are. I met with them on Thursday of last week. Uh, so that's not happening there for sure. Quarantining and COVID testing per county health guidance is recommended, but is a parent choice. So again, we're not requiring anyone to quarantine. If you want someone to be required to quarantine, if we want to adopt that practice here again, that would be an item that you would need to change here. Um, and then close contacts of positive cases may remain in school unless they develop symptoms or test positive for COVID. So that sort of seems like a good break point for any questions or comments or discussion that you wanted. And then I'll talk about <coughs> case uh, count update. So I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I just, um, you know, it's tough. I, it's, it's very tricky with, um, with close contacts and, and quarantine. I don't like to have kids out of school when they're healthy. Um, and we had a lot of kids that were quarantined last year um, because of contact tracing. Um, but it is difficult also because you don't know who's going to come down with it at any point in time. Um, obviously, the older kids have the option to get vaccinated, but that doesn't apply to anyone that's even under 12. So, um, so it's, it is just tough, but it is also really hard to tell kids that they can't be in school and in their activities um, because they happen to sit next to somebody in class that tested positive. So, you know, um, so that's tough. I, I know that, you know, we're, we're at least telling parents that um, they have been identified at identified as a close contact um, or their children have um, because of a school exposure and um, I believe we're giving them that option to quarantine if they yes we choose. text that information email and call with that very same message so they're getting it three different ways and they have an option whether to quarantine or not with the present plan unless the county health tells them they're required to quarantine but I haven't heard anyone that's had that happen yet And where are we at with, so the kids that do test positive, are they, they're out for? They're, they're out until they are uh, symptom free for okay. 24 hours. Right. Yep. And 10 days? In 10 days, yes. And 10 days. 10 and that, days. the county is telling them that. And we're not, uh, we are school excluding them, and Polk County is telling them, here is your timeline for positive cases. Is well, it possible to give any more information when, I mean, I when, know it's already a lot of tracking, but to give more information when, when they are notified that they are a close contact? Because, I mean, that's even something even from last year that, you know, people wanted to know, is this something like at lunch? Is this something of, you know, they're happy right. to sit next to them in class? I, under I understand the, the question, but the way the legality works on this, and this is way back to March of last year, on into the summer from Polk County Health, uh, you, you can't identify the positive case any lower really than building level before you get in your, yourself into in trouble with identifying a positive person. Um, we can't even identify teacher X's classroom. You, you really can't do that and be in compliance with the law. So we haven't. I would like to be able to do that, but we just simply can't. Right. It's just another difficult complication. I, I understand. Because you don't know. Who was it? Well, and not really even who was it as much as like where was it and what right. was that like because I maybe parents would feel differently if it's someone you're sitting next to in class versus it's someone you are eating lunch with but yep. you're across the table eating lunch or, you know. I think they do distinguish between classroom and sports. Like We have, we, yeah, we've identified in regards to that difference. But, but not... Are we letting parents know it was at a sport versus it was in uh, the letter school? that the letter that goes out is most typically used for um, classroom contact or school contact, 
but there's also been communication that's been given to coaches of certain teams because we've had a couple of situations like that. So that's as far down as we've identified there. And uh, we haven't gone I mean, identified specific person by any means. Right. No, it just is classroom versus someone on your sports team. So they do differentiate between that, but that's about all you can get. And so we have situations where parents have wanted more information and we we either don't have it or we can't necessarily share that. Well, I think first of all, it would be impossible to say this is where you got it. Okay. Yeah. It would be easy to say they were in a classroom setting or a school setting where this where a person was positive. That you can say, but the where you got it thing, which I think is where people are looking for, I, how could we ever say that? Yeah, right, okay. No, no I mean, I don't. I don't think you need to know where you got it. It's more of where, where was the close contact. Um, sure. To try to make an informed decision, but. And even then we might not know. That's true, right. I mean. Okay. But, yeah. you know, usually if it's a close contact and they're identifying a parent, it's because they went into the classroom and said, okay, this kid was positive, sure. who sits around them? We had a couple already. messages of that type that went home today in regards to the elementary. They were a close contact. And they can conclude it's the elementary because I got this call about my kid and my kids in the elementary. I mean, that's the logic that they would have. Right. But we didn't tell them classroom or who, because it could very well be another kid. It might not be the teacher. Other questions or comments? <coughs> well, it, it boils down to, again, responsibility and compassion and just doing the, trying to do the right thing. If you as a staff or as a community member or a student, if you're not feeling good, is to try and stay away. Um, I like the idea of unmasked and in person, we're doing okay, but it's, it's a gamble, it's a fine line that we need to do. And whether you wanna go COVID or you just wanna say it's strep throat or the flu or something like that, you know, in, in the past, you just kept your child home until they felt good and they were away from, you know, infecting or, you know, causing somebody else to be sick. So, but on the other hand, too, we need a plan. Because things happen, can happen rapidly. Well, the case count, I suppose that's a decent enough segue to yep. get into the case count. You'll see after that title page that talks about case count. This is our, um, number of cases, if you will, and you'll see all of that information up on the screen. We've got 174 through August 31st. This is the summer and then five cases and then on to the next page. You'll see the 238 and uh, 200 in the most recent window, which was in essence uh, September 1st through September 14th. In the same window, if you will, if you go to the page after the next, well, actually, let's talk about staff and students on September 1 through the 14th. That gives you an idea of where the red being students, blue being staff. You'll see that a higher preponderance of cases occurred at the high school than the other buildings. In recent days, um, you'll see the number from September 15th through the 20th, which is today. So the 194 number in four days of count, six if you counted Saturday, Sunday, are almost higher than the entire last window in regards to county cases and almost higher than the entire window when it counts the district cases. So yes, the trend line is up. So those are the numbers through the 14th and then the numbers in each building. If you went from September 15th forward, the significance of sep September 15th is it creates the most recent data, and you'll see the numbers there for students and staff. And then there's the big breakdown of cases since September 1st of 2021 to date. There are 38 cases total since September 1, and 26 of those are at the high school. Of the 26, 24 are students to our staff. And then there are seven total staff and 31 total kids. So those, yep, those are all the slides as it relates to the actual numbers. Some have said to me that I don't believe that the county number is any good or I don't believe the county, whatever they say about the county number. I, I don't have another number. I mean, it is their number. It's what they put on their dashboard. 
whether there's more or less or it's accurate, I, I, how could I ever know? It's the number. So that's the one that I grab and Becky and I put it on the spreadsheet and that's the number. In our case, it's just a lot more clear cut because we get a positive parents telling us or Polk County House telling us this one's positive. So that number is really accurate. So questions on the numbers, if you have any, or comments or questions, if you have any of those. So we're four days into this window. 15, 16, 17, and then the weekend, the 20th is four days of tracking, yes. And we have eight in the high school and five in the middle school. Well, nine in the high school, including a staff member. Yep. Yes. Okay, there are five proposals and yes, there is a sixth proposal. The sixth option is a blank piece of paper, which is you don't have a matrix at all. By all means, that's an option. Um, that's where we presently stand, and that's where you could be when the meeting adjourns here this evening, or you can adopt uh, one of the proposals. My only goal was to give you a lot of different options so you had some items to discuss and, and perhaps pick or perhaps ignore and not do any of them. So I'm just going to run through the summary, and Becky, thankfully, has summarized them on the far left of the page. Uh, the first option is similar to the 2021 matrix, but no hybrid, so there's no, I think the color was yellow, so it's green and red. Uh, both, this, both the district and county cases considered. Decisions made at the district level, and it's a 14-day window. The second option is same as option one, with mass included once you get out into the um, fourth row, so that first or third row, the, the, the first row of red there on the, ma on the matrix. The third option, there's an orange, which is right before the red. The orange is a mass, and then the red is a remote setting. Uh, both district and county cases considered. Decisions made at the individual school level versus district level, as in if there are more cases at building up high school, uh, than there are at the intermediate school, then they would have perhaps a different decision made at the high school than they would at the intermediate school. In a 14-day window, tracked Friday, Monday, that's a change as opposed to the Wednesday, Monday, uh, where you potentially have a moving into remote kind of a situation where you would need to make plans for that, such as childcare and so forth. Option four is same as option three, but rather than a 14-day window, it's a seven-day window in the same colors there, everything else is the same. And then the last one is option, again, that one was by building. And then option five is only individual school building cases considered. There's no county cases at all that are considered. So there's four columns for four schools and numbers down the left. It's a Friday to Monday and it's a seven day window. So you would track in essence every Saturday through every Friday. You don't get a Saturday and Sunday number, so it'd really be Monday through Friday and face coverings required if you're out into the orange. So those are the five options that you see listed here. And then obviously the sixth option is to not have a matrix at all. So I'll turn it over to you. If you have questions, I'll do my best. And if you have comments, certainly by all means. So it is, uh, Polk County does put out seven days track. Yeah. Uh, Polk, Polk County puts a number out each and every weekday about 2 o'clock, sometimes okay. a little earlier. They don't report a Saturday, Sunday, so you'll, whatever number is was today was for Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and they put that out. We simply go in and look each day. And I'm sure if we found there's maybe a place where it's the seven-day number, we just go and get it each day. It's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. And the difference between the seven-day window and a 14-day window, we could potentially be doing something for a week at a time yep. rather than two weeks at a time. It's presently what Hudson's doing. They have seven different schools in Hudson. They have four ele five elementary, a middle school, and a high school. Five of This is as of last week. Five of their seven schools were in mass. Two of them were not. Two elementaries were. Two elementaries were not. Um, and they track it 
every Friday for Monday. And their logic is we're, we're checking in more often uh, in that this is an ever-changing picture, rapidly so. And further, there's not as much lead time because if it was a, a situation of mass, it would be a matter of you simply need to find your mask and get it ready for Monday as opposed to arranging for child care. So that's what the logic on Friday, Monday was. Yeah, I think I like tracking, um, every, you know, with a seven day window because I think that does help us to, to see what's going on and to make accommodations immediately instead of waiting two weeks that, you know, I mean, if you, if you have a breakout or if you have a lot of cases, um, then I think people should know that and people should be able to, um, and maybe we respond, need to respond to that quicker than waiting you now up to almost two weeks or waiting two weeks, depending on. If you opt for a seven day window, if that's what you choose to do, that would be options four and five. The other three would be a 14. Not that they couldn't be modified to be that if we wanted, they could. And we have had, um, I counted 10 emails from families, um, from people asking us to adopt a matrix and to come up with a plan and a lot of them asking for us to um, require masks. Um, and I think that we do need to have a plan and we do need to consider what we, what steps we're taking when our numbers do get high. I do like looking at it per building. Um, because I think that does make a difference. If you have zero cases, then I think that you, you have a little more flexibility and freedom there. Um, I understand, you know, trying to prevent uh, spread, but I also understand, um, you know, children not having, not wanting to and not, not, you know, there's a lot of drawbacks to wearing a mask constantly. So, um, so it's, it's just a very tough thing. Um, to make this decision for all the students. I appreciate at least going by building. In regards to the county number, is that you're interested in attending to the county number or not looking at the county number? Well, I think, I think oh, yeah. well, I was just gonna say, you mentioned that, um, you know, we don't necessarily control the county number. I mean, we're taking we don't. what there are 40,000 people us. in county, some as far away as 60, 70 miles from us, yeah, certainly. So, I think yeah. it makes more sense to just look at, you know, look at the district. our district. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. And, and I don't know, I, things got really, you know, went really bad. I think whether it's countywide, you know, if it's countywide, we would probably see it here in our district. and. And hopefully we can avoid some of that in our district. And um, the issue that I would have with the county number is this: it seems illogical to me that the school district of Amory would comprise 10% of all county cases, because by that logic, if you had eight other school systems, which you do in Polk County, that means that running towards 40 or 50% of all the cases in the county are just in the school system. That that doesn't seem mathematically that doesn't jive in my mind. Maybe I'm missing something, but it, it seems off. <clears throat> yeah, I think I like the, the thought of using our numbers yeah, in our district. Like option four or five. Five gets rid of the county component altogether. And then divides by building. And oh, divides by is, building. Okay, four, you I can make four, four you can make any of them yeah. do anything you want. Okay. Yep. Yeah, four, six. <laughs> so it kind of points us towards option five would be it does. our school district. And Why then there's the notion of a seven day window or a 14 day window. Because again, if it's 14, you just change the dates. If it's seven, you leave the dates as is. But now we are prepared for masks and remote learning. I mean, if we had unlike, to. Unlike last, right. last and, year. And it, you know, I mean, if we had to go to remote learning, I think everybody's prepared for in that. And all the numbers. Okay. Sorry, and please know the numbers have increased last week uh, from the week prior and from the week prior to that. And the numbers this week are, are, st are still on the incline. In none of those weeks would we have ever been at mass based on the numbers you see here. I would be more concerned with whether we're gonna have enough teachers. 
if we have another day like we did today, we're soon not going to have enough teachers. Because not only do we have teachers getting COVID positive and going home, we also have subs that are opting out, as in I'm not coming here because I'm scared. So we have less subs than we've ever had. So if we have an upsurge amongst our staff, we're going to have a very big problem. Yeah. And that's, so, in some ways, I, you know, I understand if we have more than 40 cases in the school building that that, uh, that that seems like we should go remote. But on the other hand, I feel like, you know, do we really need to go remote? I really don't want to see us go to remote learning. I think it's more going to depend on if we don't have staff. If we got to 40 in one particular building, I think we're probably going to have a and lot of teachers yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. If we have 40. We, we had 26 at our high point last year, and that was in the whole district in a two-week window. We had so to have 40 in a seven-week window in one building, that's true. that seems like a lot. Yeah. I could be wrong, but it seems like a lot. Right. It's just if you say that we're going to go remote learning if we get to 40 and then it actually happens <laughs> we have to go to remote learning. I mean, that's just, that's tough. I mean, it was tough last year when we had to do it. And I'll say very clearly again, here, yeah. again, there are five options and then not do it at all. Whatever you decide to do, I'm not interested in being at a meeting where we come and we just change the matrix just so we can stay in business. Because if we're going to do that, don't adopt a matrix. In districts have taken that position that I'm not going to do it because I'm because I'm just going to be held to it. Whatever you choose to do, we need to follow it or don't do it at all. Yes, and like Hudson, I was looking at their their <coughs> plan today, and they don't have um, necessarily a number of going into remote. They just have a, a number of cases as to when they will be in mask and when they will not be in masks. Do you know, that too? Not, I shouldn't say when they will not be in masks. When masks are recommended and when masks are required because I think they are recommending masks. I believe they are. If you opted for option five, I would say there would be a very, very small chance you would ever get to red. Because again, if you have 40 cases in one building in a one week window, it's 10% of the building only. Yeah, that's 10 I, I don't know how that would even be possible. More, probably more. more. That would mean 10% of staff, so you're probably looking at three or four or five teachers as well. Three or four or five classroom teachers, plus all the other subs that are just out, we're going to be in trouble. So I don't think you're ever going to get the red. Yeah. You I know, could but get I felt like that last year, <laughs> then we got there. <laughs> so, I, you know, I mean, I think early if you on, got, thought, if you got to there. that point, you would have sort of a mandate coming from some other place. There'd be bigger problems. There yeah. will be a lot bigger <laughs> yeah. problems, but yeah. again, I could be so wrong. I've been wrong before on this. What did you say our biggest number was last year in a building? Tw 26 in a district, not in, in a, a building. Yeah. Yes. Okay. In so one building, I, I couldn't even tell you yeah. what it was, but it's got to be much less well, than 26. Uh, yeah, if it was 26 in a district. Probably 8, 10, roughly 8, 8 10, 10, 12, yeah. something like that. I mean, the middle school in one day had seven folks go out, seven staff, and that was during that 26 window. So the middle school was hit particularly hard during that, that time. And that was where, to the point, that's to the point we were getting at when we did have to go remote was that we were Right, that was on a Friday. And I remember Tom staff. saying to me, thank God it was a Friday because I don't know if we would be able to do this tomorrow because yeah. it was seven one afternoon. So it, it could spike in a crazy way, but again, to get 40 cases in one, one building in one week, seems a really high number yeah when last year we may have had eight maybe ten in a building you never got to 40. To, yeah could you so, get to okay. 20 in one week in one one building that's yeah. possible and there's, certainly there's been 26 in the high school for the entire for the past 20 days and so we yeah. wouldn't even be really into mask wearing yet. nope we would I mean, not that's even just yeah. a slight positive. in last that's window where our numbers yeah. started that's, that's, to that's three weeks yeah so some are going to get better. Yeah. In last window at the high school, in one week, there was 11 total cases of students and staff combined. So you would be barely halfway home to mass if the number stays where it is presently. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if we should even say something about, you know, masks recommended or, you know, something. Um, I think there's I, I an implicit that's come yes. from this board all along that that's the board's recommendation, but there you've also made it clear that it is yeah. an optional yeah. practice for yeah. parents if they choose to or don't choose to. Some are, some aren't. I guess a big part of that is 
putting our numbers on the district webpage, which mm -hmm. we have not been doing, and I think we do need to start doing. I think that yep. parents we, should we're be ready able to, to know do that. Mm -hmm. That there are, you know, this many cases at the high school yep. and zero cases at the element, or I believe there were zero cases at the elementary school. I think parents should know that yes. in order to make the best decision about masks and about based on what decision you make this evening, it'll be up and probably tomorrow afternoon. Yeah. We're ready to go. So you're right, Aaron, to that point. Um, parents have asked and so we can yep. maybe as early as tomorrow we could have I would think we can we were sort of set prior to prior to this uh, the start of this week to do it last week but we wanted to wait to hear from yeah. you so, so we could, yeah we could do that on a daily basis we could yep. post so we did last year building yeah. that's easy so that would be pretty easy for that's parents very to easy it would come late in the day because sometimes we don't know about cases until three four o'clock right. okay. it might trail by a day here and there but usually we know by the end of the it's school day seven days Five days of yep. school, but right. they, you know. Mm -hmm. The only other thing I was just thinking about, you know, in the option five, you know, when you go to the orange, um, it says face coverings required for students and staff, but maybe we should have it for all people in the building. So if parents, volunteers are coming in, that they're also masked because we're at that point, or do you want to eliminate? volunteers and parents coming into the building at that time. Did you say eliminate parents coming in at that time? I, you know, that's yeah. how do you want to do it or do I, you want I, to say I if you, think, as a parent, you come in with a mask? I think it would be best if we just required anybody who, if, if we are into the orange, right? I, I'd hate to do what we did last year and prohibit people from coming in and volunteers just make them right. wear masks. Yep. I mean, it's five days at a time. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I would. They don't have to come in. It's optional if they're a volunteer or a parent. Yep. Yep. I would agree with that. That if we got to the point of of needing masks, um, rather than saying parents can't come into the building, I would just rather have them wear a mask if if that's where we're at in the orange. Mm -hmm. So you, we can come back to this certainly. I will proceed on with the rest of the info here. Uh, the face covering section. It would simply reflect that if you adopted a matrix, whatever the matrix required of you is what you would be doing. Uh, we're gonna continue to revisit this and we'll follow any local, state, or federal requirements in regards to mask wearing, of which I know none. Uh, vaccinations, uh, we held optional vaccination sessions for students and staff in the spring. The districts uh, will not, in capital letters, require students and staff to be vaccinated. We've never had that conversation. That's never been the position of the district. And others have actually asked me of those folks that are positive on the list of the 36 people, how many of those are vaccinated, how many of those are unvaccinated? I don't have a clue. I have never asked that question and our school nurse has never asked that question. Who asked that question? Polk County Health does. And they oftentimes share it with our school nurse. But I've said all along I'm not asking and I'm still not asking. So we don't know. Uh, and lastly, we'll follow any mandate of which, again, I know none for public schools. If something happens, something happens, but haven't heard anything thus far. And lastly, uh, when we're done with whatever decision happens here this evening, uh, we'll send out a communication and linked in that letter will be our COVID page on the school district website that has all things COVID. Um, and we will send that out to parents in the way we've always done that through text messaging and emailing. Uh, and we're encouraging people to continue to communicate with us with the health status of their kids. And we want to stay afloat. We'll do all we can to do that. So those are all of the items in the return to school plan that I have for you. If you have other comments or questions, I'll do my best. Or we can go back to the matrix piece and you can weigh in on that or we just move on with the next agenda item. So that's up to you. Well, it'd be nice to put something in place that would help um, uh, give a plan <coughs> in case we do have an issue. We can always get together and do something different yeah, if we have we'll to. We'll be together. We'll, we're meeting next week, and we'll be meeting again in four weeks. So yep. it's yep. it's changing. Yeah. And the, seven the odds of us going into remote learning or even mask wearing are, are slim at this point. Right. You never know, but... 
if we go yes. with this if we go with this matrix. Yeah. Oh, yep. Yeah. I'm yeah. talking about yep. number five. Yeah. With five, you know, and it's only a, a seven day period. It is not a permanent no. month period or something like that. So it would it basically would change, and we would as a board would only have to step in in cases like okay, now we're in our third week, and we're having still having issues. To, what do we do there? in a building itself you know we can always address that later but this kind of just gives a a baseline for administration to follow uh tomorrow meeting i meet with tomorrow morning i meet with administrative team so all the other items such as sanitation disinfection uh, bus transportation pickup drop off lunch all of that other stuff that exists when you talk COVID mitigation, that's on the docket for us to talk about. Are there other things that we need to do? Simple measures like whether or not you turn off the water fountains and have water bottles or just have water fillers, um, those conversations. But I didn't bring those here this evening because I believe the administrative team has the skill set to be able to figure that out. So we'll work on that tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. So is there a motion to approve the return to school plan with an option or is that not where yes, we're I'm at? I'm just still considering a little bit of you okay. know, the numbers um, and do they need to be different at all as far as the size of each building and how many students are in each building? Okay. Well, the building sizes range from the high schools and the 480, 490 range to the smallest building, the intermediates at about 270 or so. So yeah, there is a difference. Not hundreds or thousands by any means like there would be in a Hudson High School versus a Hudson Elementary School. Yeah. Um, middle school and elementary school are between those two numbers in the 300s, in some cases upper 300s. So we certainly can. You could charge me with that duty to wordsmith that right now or get our calculators out might not be the best use of everyone's time, but we certainly can if that's what you want. Mm -hmm. Well, again, it's only a seven day window, yeah. which really helps with uh, whether you're at 270 or 490. And obviously from the cases we have, the high school has been the brunt of it. Sure, and I, I would imagine that part of that reality is they're more mobile. Yeah. They're out and about more because they, they drive and have jobs and so forth. And second, many of them are playing athletics and we've had some outbreaks in our athletic teams. Yep. So those numbers are not surprising in that regard. Yep. Well, do we have any idea for a motion on it? Well, I guess I would just say that um, I think my, <laughs> my goal, and I think I could probably speak for everybody, we want to keep our kids safe, keep our staff safe, and keep kids in school as much and hopefully for the whole year. Um, I would like to keep the activities going. You know, we have sports going and uh, for the most part, I think everything is going pretty well, sports related. I don't know, Josh, at the high school level and lower levels. And um, so I'd like to keep those activities going. Um, I would, uh, I like the idea of having a plan if something does get worse. So I don't know, I would make a motion to, um, I guess, approve this return to school plan with option five. Um, yeah, as you know, using option five as our matrix. And, and I agree, and just to simplify the plan for people who are, you know, looking at this online or whatever, I just, I'm not sure of the difference between 0 and 10 and 11 to 20. Why couldn't it just be 0 to 20 and 21 to 40? I know someone, I know someone. <laughs> Make it a little simpler yeah. to look at. I know someone really good at Excel spreadsheets <laughs> that can help me with that. Because I, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Yeah. No, that's a good point, yeah. We could just have three lines, yeah. I guess. You yeah. could. Three yeah. lines, three colors. But yes, I like and option number five, and I will, make a, I will second that motion. And it's important to also maybe mention that if we were using option five today, all the school year, right, we would be in no mask. Correct. We would be in person, yep. 
yes. with no mass, mass would be optional. Correct. Yep. And we're yep. we're still a ways away from even with the face huge coverings. spike in yeah. cases in Polk County, we are still in in person no mask. Yes, and our district, our weeks. buildings in our district are still um, a ways away from having face masks required. Correct. Although it could happen. And there's people that well, will could. be unhappy yes. that we are not making those numbers smaller and that we're not requiring masks sooner. You know, because yeah. again, yeah. we're kind of maybe pushing the envelope at the high school and not requiring masks at the high school. And I, I know that there are people that are concerned that, yeah. um, that maybe we're kind of ignoring. The, they're that. concerned that we're not requiring masks today at the yeah. high school. Right. Yes. Yep. No, I would well, agree with I that. Think this is a good compromise because you know there's also the option six where there's nothing and then there's you know the, the options where there's you know one but this is kind of meeting in the middle I, and it's yeah just, it is temporary and we can always change it and we're i feel like week. it's a plan yeah. that everybody hopefully can live with um it's a week at a time you know yeah the seven days is the key the key to me that you know this can change and drop back into in person, well, you know, or from face covering to in person in, in a week, yeah. and, and we're back to normal again. Yeah. So that's what's kind of nice with having it that. Did you want to add that all staff, all that are in the building are masked? Uh, I, yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we have a. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. That's that's, a that good makes sense. School day. Yeah. Yep. Correct. Yeah. And just that thank you. Sense. Yeah. And also, from my understanding and everybody's understanding, that um, parents would still be allowed in the buildings. Mm -hmm. They would yep. just need to wear a mask. If if, if in orange. orange. That way. If, it's like if in orange. School, Not right now. Sporting events. Can, what was that, Sean? If in orange during the school day. Right. Not right now. Right. In yes. After school. After they're schools. completely optional. Yes, yep. right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Did you get that, Becky? <laughs> got a lot of stuff going on. And then what time on Friday is the determination? Is it like... Is well, it the number for... Well, we don't have to worry about the county number, but the end of the school day, we still got things floating in, so I, I would assume that we could get that out. We could set a time of 2 o'clock or something. I, I don't know I that mean, Tracy and Becky happen. and I want to stick around until 6 to make sure it's all set. Yeah. Mid-afternoon, I would think, would be reasonable, and we would send out a correspondence to everybody. And given the fact that you know the daily numbers, you, you could probably see it coming. Oh, sure. Yeah. Give sure. Yeah. It yep. up. <laughs> it's been a, a steady, you know, yeah. four or five, six each day yeah. recently. Okay. Um, motion is made and seconded. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Okay. We've got a little plan going. That's good. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next is the donation. Donations, yes. We have a donation to the Angel Fund from the Amory Lions Club from their annual golf outing of $2,165.38. So thank you very much to the Lions Club for thinking of us. Joe Hansen, thank you to Joe Hansen for donating $200 to the Lean Elementary Angel Fund and the Parents as Partners group. Tina Morris, thank you to community member Tina Morris for donating 50 boxes of Kleenex, an item always in high demand. Willow Ridge Healthcare River Bend Senior Living, thank you for the pencils for our students and the snacks for our staff. SMC did a roundup on school supplies. So uh, thank you to SMC for the donation of school supplies for our students. Yep. And that is it. So we'll need a motion to accept those donations. <coughs> I'll make a motion to accept those donations with a big thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll second that. Also, thank you for your, yes. for your support of our students and our school district. All, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Gee, none. I can't believe that. Can you? What a well, great deal. Thank you so awesome. much, really. That's great community support. We have a very generous community. Yes. On to the second reading <clears throat> of the updates. Uh, access to board policies. It's no longer a policy handbook. It's simply not what we call it anymore. 
nothing's changes, changed since you saw this last in August. It was simply an out-of-date policy dated back 2000. So we're 21 years later. We're trying to move on to 2021 is all it is. Mm -hmm. I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the second reading of this policy. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Dale. All those in favor say aye. 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 And opposed, no. Okay. Next up, we have the personnel. Personnel, new employees, Lori Becker, second grade teacher, Jeremy Heatland, bus driver, Nicole Link, food server, Ashley Papp, special ed teacher, Bridget Stokeland, special ed para, extracurricular contracts for Casey Doton, seventh grade girls basketball coach, and resignations for Janice Arnold in clubhouse, Amy Bjorgi, special ed para, Melissa Hansen, girls head soccer, and Ann Monette as a bus driver. So we'll need a motion to accept the personnel items. So moved. Okay. And, sorry. You're gonna... I will abstain from voting on this as well. I will uh, second that motion. Okay, Chelsea. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And they are approved. Any need to go into closed again? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> no, good. Motion to adjourn. So, I had a, before we do, I hate to do this. No. Nope. So this, I got a, an extra sheet here that says not in board book included. It's just right. if you wanted to 